Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome again to the welcome again to the physics colloquium. Very good. I think they have turned down the gain on the mic, which means I will compensate by turning up my gain. So again, no, no, uh, there's a uh, interference and feedback. So it is a will for turning it down. But anyway, welcome. It is our pleasure to have with us today, Professor Vidya Madhavan. And Professor Madhavan received her bachelor's degree in metallurgical engineering uh, from IIT Chennai, and a master's of technology degree in solid state materials from IIT in Delhi. She obtained her PhD from Boston University in the year 2000, and she's held postdoctoral appointments at the University of California from 1999 to 2002 before joining the faculty at Boston College. She joined the faculty of Illinois in 2014 as a full professor. Professor Madhavan in investigates fundamental problems in quantum materials, where interactions between the spin charge and structural degrees of freedom lead to emergent phenomena. She uses the tools of scanning tunnel microscopy, STM, scanning tunnel spectroscopy, STS, spin polarized STM, SPSTM, and molecular beam epitaxy MBE to unravel the mysteries of complex systems at the atomic scale. Her group carries out challenging high-risk experiments wherein the possibility of discovering new phenomena is high. Her team's recent work has focused on STM studies of bulk and monolayer compounds whose properties lie at the intersection of topology, magnetism, strong correlations, and superconductivity. We are doubly happy today, one, to have you as a speaker, and two, to tell everyone that you will be joining us for a semester as a Miller visiting professor in the fall. So please join me in welcoming Professor Madhavan. I was here as a postdoc for three years, and it was just fantastic. The sun was always shining. There were no gray days. It, it, it rained, but just enough that the roses could grow. And, 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 I, and people have been telling me, oh, it's been raining so much in Berkeley. And I just wanted to tell you that, no, look, I took this photograph from one of your windows this morning. And there's no rain clouds in the sky. So I don't know what you guys are talking about. As far as I'm concerned, Berkeley's still gorgeous with the, you can't hear me in the back? But my, uh, OK. No, the mic is on. The mic is on. Can you hear me now? No, is it? I can, I can shout. Do you want me to shout? OK. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, so you could not hear me at the back there? So yeah? Oh, okay. Okay, okay, I can do that. Anyway, in case you didn't hear me, it's not raining in Berkeley. <laughs> okay, so today my goal is to tell you about uh, some new experiments we've done. Uh, where we, uh, you, we use this new technique that couples light with scanning tunneling microscopy to answer a very particular question. And the particular question we're trying to answer is, uh, is there this very exotic uh, state called a loop current ordered state or flux charge density wave state? The important thing is this charge density wave state breaks time reversal symmetry and it, it was predicted at first by Chandra Varma uh, in the context of the cube rates. And a lot of people have been searching for this and it's been very difficult to see. So the question is, do we find any evidence for this in this new class of materials called the Kogome superconductor? So that's my long introduction. Uh, this is my group. Uh, and I only show you this because these are not all the people who contrib contributed to the work I'm about to show you today. But at the beginning of the talk, I'll be showing you a lot of STM data. And much of that data was taken by this group of people. Uh, so the STM was invented by Binning and Rohr in 1981. And the moment you know, they saw the first images, which was basically line by line raster uh, images, it actually opened up a whole new world where we can not only see atoms, image atoms, but also the quantum mechanical wave function 
of electrons and other quasi-particles. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize uh, in physics in 1986 for, this, uh, for the invention of these amazing instruments. And for the first few minutes, I want to show you what can we do with a modern version of the STM. Okay, and so before that, I'd like to show you how the STM works. Um, so the way the STM works is you, it's a, in principle, a very simple instrument. You bring a very thin metallic wire to within a few angstroms. So look at this length scale here, a few angstroms of the surface that you want to look at. And then this, this wire is called the tip. And you turn on a small, small potential difference between the, this so-called tip and the sample and electrons tunnel across vacuum, the vacuum barrier from the sample to the tip or to the tip to the sample. And we call this tunneling, uh, we call this current the tunneling current. And this is the one quantity that we measure with the STM, the tunnel current. And by just by measuring this one quantity as a function of bias voltage, as a function of magnetic fields, as a function of various different parameters, we can get a huge amount of information on the properties, the spin, charge, topology of quantum materials. Uh, of course, in practice, the STM is a slightly more complicated because the tip is only a few angstroms from the surface. You have to put it in a vibration isolation room. You have to isolate it from ground vibrations by putting it on uh, air legs. If you want high resolution, you have to go to low temperatures. And finally, if you want to keep your surfaces clean because the scanning tunneling microscope is a surface sensitive probe, you have to have ultra high vacuum. So at the end of the day, even though the STM itself is a tiny little thing, it ends up that the machines that we call scanning tunneling microscopes are these gigantic objects with ultra high vacuum chambers, vibration isolation legs, a doer to hold liquid helium that can go to 300 millikelvin or even to dilution fridge temperatures. And this is an example, a photograph of one of the STMs in my lab. And the size of this is about an inch by an inch and a half. So it's pretty tiny compared to the scale of this object, which is the size of a room. So the way, the, there's a very nice visual way to see what an STM measures. Uh, you can think of both the tip and the sample as a bucket of electrons filled up to the Fermi energy. Um, and just like two buckets of water, if you uh, bring them together and connect them together, if the level of water in one bucket is higher, then water will flow from that bucket to the other bucket until the two levels are equalized. The same thing happens to the tip and the sample. They are buckets of electrons. You bring them together, the two Fermi energies line up. The potential is the same. And then if you apply a small potential difference between them, electrons tunnel, in this case, for example, from the sample to the tip, and that gives you the tunnel current. So that immediately tells you that the tunnel current should be proportional to the total number of states available for tunneling from this energy to the bias voltage. So that you should integrate all the states to, to get the net tunnel current. And this is what this formula tells you, the tunnel current is proportional to these delta functions, or each delta function is a state, in the sample or the tip, because this just shows you the sample. And the only thing is that each state is weighted by the square of the wave function. That's all, that's what the STM measures. And so because of this, uh, you can also show that the tunnel current is exponentially sensitive to the distance between the tip and the sample. And that gives us the ability to get atomic scale images. Uh, the DIDV differential conductance is proportional to this object, which is the density of states, which is the number of states per unit energy. So this is what we can measure with the STM. So let me give you a few examples of what we can measure. A very popular thing to measure is an image, a topographic image of the surface. This is an image of the superconductor ion selenide. And each of these sort of impurities that you see here, these one, two, three, these are actually single atom impurities. They just look like this because of the density of state. So you've seen hundreds of images like this. It's almost come to the point where you take this for granted. However, there's a huge amount of information hiding in these images. Let me see, show you what happens when you take the same ion selenide and add tellurium. Now the image looks like this. 
that chemical inhomogeneity, which occurs because of the addition of tellurium, now translates into electronic inhomogeneity. Um, so now if you go to the other end member, iron telluride, FESC that I showed you before is a superconductor. FETE is an antiferromagnet, antiferromagnetic metal. It has a very peculiar kind of antiferromagnetism where you have bicollinear stripes. The interesting thing about STM is when you do normal STM with a tungsten tip or some metallic tip, you see only the atoms here you're measuring the tellurium atoms. But if you use some kind of a, a magnetic tip, now suddenly you're able to see the stripes resulting from the antiferromagnetism in this compound. So you can image spin at the atomic scale using the STM. You can also measure strain because we have information on where each atom is. We also know how each atom deviates from the position where it should be. This is a, a, this is a film that we've grown of tin telluride, which is a topological insulator, topological crystalline insulator on a substrate, and the lattice mismatch between these two results in this, in this kind of superstructure. What I'm showing you in red and blue is an image of the strain in the sample. The red and blue regions show you regions of compressive and tensile strain. So we can actually measure strain at, at, at atomic length scales and correlate it with the changes in band structure also at the same length scale. This, finally, I'm moving away from topography. This is a density of states map. This material, niobium diselenide 1T, is actually a MOT insulator, and many people believe it's a spin liquid. Mike has images of this, uh, similar images on a sister compound. And what we believe is that this pattern of dots is where the electrons actually sit at, this, at a particular energy and if you take a Fourier transform of this, you see evidence for a spin liquid in this compound. Here's another density of states map. All these wave-like objects are indeed electron waves. They're the quantum mechanical wave function of an electron that you can see with your eye. The these are electrons that are scattering off of these impurities and are giving rise to these interference patterns. And the beautiful thing about these interference patterns is that you can use this to measure band structure. And so here's an example of how you do that. So you take a map, a DIDV map, as a function of energy, and then you take its Fourier transform. Uh, I want to show you, pause here for a moment, because I want to show you what this Fourier transform actually contains, the information that it contains. These four dots here are actually the Bragg peaks. So they represent the lattice. So the distance from the center to the Bragg peak is 2 pi over the lattice constant. So if you can measure the distance from here to here, you can invert that to get the lattice constant. This also tells you that any changes in the position of these peaks will, will, will you know, you can get that from the Fourier transform, and that tells you if there's any changes in the lattice constant in your sample. In addition, you have these features this is called quasi-particle interference. It's actually just, in this case, electron interference. And the beautiful thing about this is, this represents the band structure of this very interesting um, uh, superconductor called strontium glutinate. And I can show you how this changes with energy. And you can see that, similar to RPES, you can measure dispersion. So this is how the band structure of this material is actually evolving with energy. OK, so finally, there's one last thing I want to show you that we can measure with STM. You can not only get uh, amplitude information from the Fourier transform, but you can also get phase information. And this is really interesting. This actually is phase information extracted from the same kinds of maps, the IDV map and Fourier transform that I just showed you. What this is showing you is the phase of a charge density wave. So this should be charge, I'm sorry about that. So a charge density wave is a, a, a new periodicity that arises in some materials. And the reason that the uh, system chooses to do this, basically the charge organizes itself into a new period. And by doing this, the whole system is able to lower its energy. 
And that new period of the charge is called a charge density wave. And mit many materials show very interesting charge de density waves. In fact, the material that I'm going to talk about today is one such example of a material with a very exotic charge density wave. What I'm showing you here is the charge density wave in this superconductor called uranium telluride. And what I'm plotting here is the phase slip. So each point here is a position where the charge density wave actually has a phase slip, which is the space actually has a finite value. And the way the charge density wave uh, uh, is gets destroyed, in fact, this CDW gets destroyed with a magnetic field, which is very strange, is by creating more and more phase slips. That's what these images are telling you. So this is all the information that you can measure with the STM. You get, get spatially resolved density of states. You have a huge number of control knobs like gating, temperature, magnetic field. And with all of this, you can measure a huge number of things. You can ask questions about electron phonon coupling. You can ask questions about Cooper pairs, charge density waves, spin, spin, spin density waves, phase transitions, and much more. So the question is, what's the next frontier in STM? Remember, the STM was invented in 1981. And the techniques have, that I've been talking about have been developed over the last few decades. So is there a next frontier? Is there something else we can do with the STM? And the answer is yes. You can think of many things to do. But one of the things I'm interested in is to couple light, basically laser light, photons from laser light, with a scanning sounding microscope. And what can you do with this? Well, the, a laser is very interesting. It has photons have uh, frequency, different frequencies different polarizations. So different frequencies means different energies. Uh, and you can control the direction of the electric field. You can break time reversal symmetry by, by shining circularly polarized light. You can do all kinds of things with laser light. So you can create electronic or a phononic excitations with laser light in your sample. You can create transient and metastable phases by shining light on sample, uh, you can, as I said, break time reversal symmetry. And the most important thing, which is actually the holy grail of people who are trying to do light coupled STM, is there are protocols by which you can use light coupled STM to measure dynamics. Remember, so far, all the information you get from STM is static information. But there are protocols by which you can use light to measure dynamics. And so today I'll, I'm going to tell you about a system we've set up. We haven't yet been able to measure dynamics, but already by shining light onto this particular material, we've been able to actually answer a very important controversial question in this class of Kagome superconductors. So here's our pulse laser system, and I'll, and I'll show you in a bit uh, what the different pieces are. So today I'm going to talk with that long preamble uh, talk about optical and magnetic field response of the charge density wave phase in this particular compound, rubidium vanadium antimony. This is called RVS in short. These are the people who did the work. The, the uh, laser STM was built by my, my postdoc, Sokchin Bei. Uh, Sokchin and Yu Ching collaborated to the work, do the work on the Kagome superconductors. We had a huge amount of theory help from Rafal's group, as well as VK and Grand at Boston College. Um, and our single crystals were grown in the group of Stephen Wilson in Santa Barbara. OK. So we've known for many years that in condensed matter systems, uh, you can break time reversal symmetry by having ordered spins. For example, electrons have spins. If they are organize themselves into a ferromagnet, that breaks time reversal symmetry. If they organize themselves into an antiferromagnet, that also breaks time reversal symmetry. So typically, whenever you have broken time reversal symmetry in a condensed matter system, it comes from electronic spins. The question is, is there another way to break time reversal symmetry? And the answer is yes. There's an exotic way to break time reversal symmetry, and that is by having spontaneous currents. So normally in a solid state system, you have equal numbers of go electrons that go in one direction and another direction. 
but you could instead have more electrons going in one direction in a particular way, right? In this way that you can get these loops of current and these loops of current, uh, they, spontane they arise spontaneously in order to minimize the energy of the system. And whenever you have a loop, you can think of it as having an effective, uh, little effective magnetic field. And that also breaks down the person. So this idea that you could have these loop currents was actually postulated by Chandra Varma in 1997. And then a couple, uh, there were many other papers about this. This was done in the context of the cube rate. And so, so this is what we are looking for in this class of materials that I'm going to talk about today. So the class of materials that I'm talking about are these so-called Kagome superconductors. And the word Kagome is like a, this, it's a traditional Japanese woven bamboo pattern. It looks like this. It's got little stars. You can see these little stars everywhere. And the compound that we're talking about is also a Kagome compound. It's got these little star patterns of vanadium antimony atoms. Okay. There are many, many Kagome compounds, um, and they have very interesting properties. Um, sorry, let me just show you the crystal structure of the one that I'm going to talk about. So here's the, uh, the AV3 antimony 5 compound. It's a layered compound. So the Kagome layer looks like this. It has vanadium in this Kagome lattice, and then antimony in these positions, um, which form a hexa hexagonal lattice. The layer above that is an antimony honeycomb uh, uh, layer, and this is the layer that we'll be looking at with the STM. And the layer about that is this alkali uh, layer, and we're not going to talk about this very much, okay? So the reason these Kagome compounds are interesting is that a lot of them have both Dirac dispersion, 3D Dirac dispersion, as well as flat bands. In this particular Kagome compound, the flat band lives very high above the Fermi energy. The interesting thing about flat bands is if you can bring the flat, flat band close to the Fermi energy, you can have very strong correlations. That doesn't happen in this, in this compound, but instead you do have high density of states due to these so-called manhole singularities where the band bends over like this. And that high density of states is responsible for a lot of interesting physics in these compounds. This material has two phases. As you cool down from high temperatures, at around 100 Kelvin, it transitions into this exotic charge density wave phase that I've been talking about. And then at much lower temperatures, at around one or three Kelvin, it becomes a superconductor. So, so here's an image, STM image, of the, uh, the compound above the charge density wave transition temperature. Now we're looking at this um, uh, antimony layer, and you can see these little, uh, these patterns here that, that tell, you know, that's what I showed you earlier. Um, this is the honeycomb of the antimony. So there is no charge density wave here. This is a Fourier transform and you just see the Bragg peak. When you cool down to low temperatures, you enter the CDW phase. You can see these two images look different by our eye. And at, when you take the Fourier transform, you see extra peaks. And these six extra peaks represent the charge density wave peak. So in this compound, you have an additional periodicity that happens at low temperatures, which is twice the atomic periodicity in three different directions. The interesting thing is that the charge density wave transition is associated with a pretty large lattice distortion. This means that there is very strong coupling between electrons and phonons in the system. So the one question you can ask is, what additional symmetries that does the CDW bring? So if you look at the Fourier transform in the previous slide, or actually I have it here, you can see there are these six CDW peaks and in theory, the intensities of all these six peaks should be identical. So they shouldn't break any additional symmetries. But it turns out that that's not true. You can, by a huge number of measurements, STM, optics, and X-rays, you can show that the charge density wave breaks rotational symmetry. And that what that means in this particular uh, uh, Fourier transform is that one of, the, one of these peaks, this one and this one, one pair, is more intense than these other two pair. 
And just by doing that, by, by being more intense in one particular direction, you've broken rotation. But the more interesting thing is that the charge density wave also breaks, at least by some measurements, time reversal symmetry. So this material has no magnetic moment. And you don't have to you know, understand this. All I can tell you is that this is uh, muon, uh, muon style measurements. And you can see that there are no spins in the system, no isolated spins. And yet, the material breaks time reversal symmetry. The first studies were done by STM. So what they did is the following. These are the six CDW peaks. As I pointed out already, they are actually have different intensities. So this one is least intense, this one is most intense. And what this work shows, this was work done by Zahid Hassan. He showed that the intensity of these peaks is sensitive to a magnetic field. So when you apply, this is at plus two Tesla, this is the highest peak. At minus two Tesla, you see this one is higher than this. So the relative intensity of the charge density wave peak can be manipulated with a magnetic field. And this was taken to be evidence for broken time reversal symmetry. So this is a system which has, which has no local moments, and yet the charge density wave responds in a way that suggests that there's broken time reversal symmetry. That was followed by uh, MUSR measurements in a magnetic field that showed that in a magnetic field, you have an enhanced relaxation rate below the charge density wave transition temperature. And this also indicates that the CDW breaks down the world. So since then, there have been a huge host of theoretical proposals with different kinds of loop currents proposed for this uh, exotic charge density wave phase. But However, at the same time, the idea that the material breaks time reversal has become extremely controversial. Um, the first controversy comes from Kerr effect measurements. Uh, again, you don't have to know the detail. Uh, they measure this parameter theta, and you can see below the CDW transition, one, this experiment shows that there's a, a change in this uh, theta. Whereas this experiment shows no change across the CDW. So two different experiments showing completely different results. Again, remember the STM data I showed you. This, in this sample, the charge density wave responds to magnetic field. But then there was a later on experiment that was done that showed that there was no response of the CDW to magnetic field. So the question is, is time reversal symmetry broken? If not, how do we understand this, this new, new on spin resonance data? How can, can we reconcile these different measurements? And finally, there's a very important question. Remember, I showed you in STM that CDW peaks have a certain intensity. The question is, is the intensity of these CDW peaks that you see in these Fourier transforms, does it have any physical meaning? What physical meaning can we attribute to these, uh, these peaks? And so we are in the situation of the blind man and the elephant, different probes are giving you different answers. So what we'd like to know is time reversal symmetry broken? Is there any evidence for this exotic loop current phase? So one question you can ask is, you've heard me go on and on about broken time reversal symmetry. One question you can ask is, why are we interested in this exotic loop current phase? What are the consequences? So there are actually many consequences of having this exotic phase. Uh, one thing is it actually tells you something important about the material itself. It tells you that uh, correlations might be important in having the CDW. But more importantly, remember, you, this is a superconductor. And it's a superconductor that arises below, way below the charge density wave transition temperature. That means that the superconductor lives in, if time reversal symmetry were broken, the superconductor arises within a broken time reversal symmetric phase. So that must have consequences for superconductivity. And in fact, theory predicts that it does. Theory predicts that you can have, in the superconducting phase, you can have superconducting currents circling around, just like you had single electrons circling around. And if you have supercurrents circling around, 
these, so you would get vortices and anti-vortices that occur in some kind of ordered pattern below the superconducting transition temperature. So indeed, this is a really interesting question. And so we need a new perspective to resolve this controversy. And that's why, that's where this laser STM comes in. So th these are the components of the laser STM. This is the STM. This is a commercial system. And all this was built by my uh, postdoc, Sokjun, and graduate student, Arjun Dada. The important thing about our system is inside the UHV chamber, we have uh, lenses uh, both uh, on, on both sides uh, to focus light onto a small 10 micron size. So this is the light. Actually, this is a photograph of the tip sample junction. You can see the STM tip here. You can see light. And this is the reflection of the tip from the sample. So using uh, the, this optics, we can actually position the tip right on top of the optical beam, which has a diameter of 10 micron. So the way this experiment is done, there are many modes of operation, is that we, we secure a region, we actually retract the tip, shine light, and then we turn off the light. So this is not, the experiments were not done in the presence of light. We use the light to create a mess, metastable or a, or a sort of long-lived state, and then we turn off the light and then reapproach and do the measurements. Okay. So this is a topography. So let me just march you through what we see in the Fourier transform of uh, this compound. So this is topography. You can see the atoms uh, in, this, uh, in this material. You can also see one of the charge density waves. So you can see these stripes. Uh, these stripes are an additional periodicity that represents one of the CDWs. So, so, so first, let me point out the Bragg peaks. You have six of them. These are the Bragg peaks. And then uh, inside, you have the six charge density wave peaks. And then you, additionally, you have quasi-particle interference. I showed you this before. These, this, is, this tells you about the band structure of the material. Now, like it was seen before, if you take line cuts along the three directions, you have the Bragg peaks. They have different heights. But also the charge density wave peaks, one, two, three, they also have different heights. This is not surprising. This has been seen before. This, this tells you these three intensities being different tells you that two kinds of symmetries are broken. First, rotational symmetry is broken. But also, because this peak and this peak don't have the same intensity, mirror symmetry is also broken. OK. So now I'm going to show you data on what happens when we turn on light. Our original intent was to try and manipulate this charge density wave pattern, high, low, least, high, using circularly polarized light. That actually did not work. And so my uh, student and, po and my postdocs decided to try linearly polarized light. And so I'm going to show you data for what happens when you shine linearly polarized light. So we're able to take light and uh, point the electric field along these three different CDW directions. So let's start here. And so you can see these are the uh, six charge density wave peaks. I1, this is this peak, is higher than I3. OK, great. Now I'm going to shine light along this direction, the I3 direction. And now you can see I3 is greater than I1. Okay. And now I'm going to shine light along I1 again, and you can see I1 is greater than so what we're doing here is that by shining light along different directions, we are manipulating the intensity of the charge density wave. OK? OK, so far, so good. So what does this mean? Well, first, let me show you it's extremely robust. We have 100% fidelity, meaning if you shine light along some given direction, the charge density wave along that direction is going to get stronger. OK? So the question is, what could be happening? One hypothesis is that this, this, is, this is happening because the charge density wave is coupled very strongly to phonons and therefore to lattice distortion. And it's possible that the electric field of the light is shaking phonons along a given direction. And it's also actually causing something called electrostriction, meaning that 
the atoms themselves, the positions of the atoms are actually changing due to the presence of light. The interesting thing about SPM is we can check this. So we can actually ask the question, if in a given direction, the charge density wave gets stronger, right? If, if light makes this PDW higher, then do you have more lattice distortion in that direction? So the way we do it is we look at these Bragg peaks. There are six of them. They represent the lattice positions in the, th uh, in the three directions. You can zoom in on, on these Bragg peaks. So I've zoomed in here on this Q3, right, this one. And I can look at what happens to the position of this Bragg peak when you shine light. And you can see that when I shine light along Q3, this direction, the position of this shifts. So it shifts from here to here. And then when you shine light along Q1, this shifts back. So the Bragg peaks move when the charge density wave gets stronger. In fact, there's a direct correlation. Every time there's a charge density wave gets stronger, the Bragg peak in that direction move outwards, which means that the atoms are actually getting closer. So a stronger charge density wave is associated with a larger lattice distortion. That's what this light tells me. OK, so what have we learned by shining light? We've learned that the CDW intensity can be manipulated by light. OK. Uh, that it tells you that the charge density wave intensity as measured by the Fourier transform is a, it's a physical property of the system and it actually has physical meaning and it's not an artifact of the tip or something else. Um, it also tells you that uh, the, the strong charge density wave intensity is associ associated with a strong lattice distortion in that direction, okay? Um, that means that in this system, the, 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 the charge density wave is extremely susceptible to strain. Strain is when you change the relative uh, lattice constant in one direction versus the other direction. That's what strain does at the atomic scale. If you did that, then the CDW would respond in this system. Okay? So that's what we've learned from the light. So now, so far, I've said nothing about time reversal symmetry. What about time reversal symmetry? So to understand whether you have broken time reversal symmetry, what we need to do is actually go back and do the magnetic field experiment. But now we can ask a different question. We, we don't just ask, can we manipulate the charge density wave with a magnetic field? We also ask, is there a corresponding lattice distortion that goes along with it? So here I show you data, so plus two Tesla, you have this arrangement of the CDW, minus two Tesla, it's a different arrangement. So let's like look here. So for plus two Tesla, I3 is greater than I1. For minus two Tesla, I1 is greater than I3. And then we can do this over and over and over again. Sorry, I, I, we can do this over and over again, I'll show you in a bit. And basically everything, just like light, every time you change the magnetic field, the charge density wave responds. Now, so like I said, this, the mechanism behind this response, this is a very weird thing, right? How can a magnetic field in a perpendicular direction create a change in the charge density wave in plane? So the mechanism behind this, uh, it, you can theorize that it's actually something called piezomagnetism, which is when you apply a magnetic field, the lattice actually distorts, just like we saw for light. So that would be the idea. So we can check this, right? So here's a sequence of light going one way, another way, one way. I'm sorry, uh, magnetic field going one way, another way, one way, another way. And this is the Bragg ratio. Once again, this tells you how much the Bragg peaks change in response. And again, there's 100% fidelity. When the CDW in one direction gets stronger, there's more distortion in that direction. Okay, so from all of these studies, we should be able to actually understand what the CDW is made of, okay? So we, we've seen electrostriction, piezomagnetism, uh, uh, both occur in this sample. So what, what does this tell us about the CDW phase? So now let's think about the CDW. So we have 
two kinds of uh, orders that, uh, that could exist. One is the usual charge density wave bond order that happens in three different directions, one, two, three. And the other is the loop current order that I've been talking about that also has currents going in three different directions, one, two, three. These are spontaneous currents. The fact that the charge density wave responds to magnetic field and the fact that we can show it's real, it's not an artifact, we can do it over and over again. It's also associated with a lattice distortion. That tells you that the charge density wave breaks time reversal symmetry. That means that in the absence of spin, some kind of loop current order must exist in this time. So we worked with our theory collaborators and they were able to write down a, um, a sort of a, a simple uh, Ginsburg-Landau uh, expression, which follows the symmetries of the system and you can show that the symmetry, so our two experiments, the electrostriction as well as the, the piezomagnetism, impose constraints on the possible CDW. So the electrostriction tells you that you should have these three uh, bond orders where one is different from the other two. And the, uh, the magnetic field of piezomagnetism also imposes constraints. And it tells you that you should have loop current orders that look like that. Okay. Uh, and finally, I don't want to go into this. Uh, uh, basically, uh, they also were able to show that if you want the system to have no net magnetism, then the there is a rotational. There are two possible rotational axes. They should coincide with one another. And so this is called a congruent um, bond order. Okay, so I, I think I'm almost at the end actually. Um, so essentially using light as well as magnetic field, we're able to determine what the charge density wave in the system should look like. What light was able to do for us was to show that the CDW intensities actually have physical meaning. Um, and also to show that very, you know, in a very clear way that the CDW intensity is directly tied to the amount of lattice distortion. And then we were able to use that information and go back to doing the magnetic field studies and establish that indeed time reversal symmetry is broken in this system. So, um, so how can we now finally, let's say we've established that there's broken time reversal symmetry. How do we now reconcile these different measurements that different groups have seen over the last few years? And actually there's a simple answer to that question. This material, as we've already shown, uh, is strongly sensitive to lattice parameters and to lattice distortion. Uh, that means that any strain in the system, you know, unintentional strain, is going to actually pin the charge density wave or create uh, uh, extra, uh, sorry, for example, let me show you this. If you have shear strain in the system, then you can actually have a net magnetic moment because now you no longer have this uh, rotational, this axis of rotational symmetry, and then you can have this being stronger than this, and that will give you a net moment. So essentially, the material is extremely sensitive to strain. We ourselves have seen this. Remember the magnetic field thing that I was telling you where the, uh, the charge density wave intensities actually change with magnetic field? There are areas which are highly strained in the same sample. We can see that because there's usually a line, a dislocation line or something like that running through that area. And if you go to those areas and try to do the magnetic field studies, you see nothing the strong strain can pin the charge density wave and prevent it from responding to magnetic field. Okay, so that's all I have to say about these Kagome uh, superconductors. There's a lot of work to be done, but really the question is where do we go next? And the answer is that we'd like to actually study dynamics and that would be the next thing. And hopefully I've been able to convince you that using this combination of techniques, we've actually shown that in this particular material, we have this very interesting loop current order. Thank you for your attention.
thank you, Vidya, for a wonderful talk. The floor is open for questions. Dan? Yeah, actually, they did. Yeah, there is this this very cool. Um, um, I didn't have time to put that in here, but there's very there's a very there's very cool work by Philip Moll's group where they've been able to measure transport uh, and magneto transport, and they're basically uh, all their measurements are very. Good. What they do is they use FIB and they take a huge amount of trouble to minimize strain in the sample. And, and when, by doing that, they're able to make very sensitive measurements and show that all of this, um, all of this that we've shown here is, uh, is very consistent with what they measure in terms of magnetotransport. So they see the same broken rotational symmetry, um, and then they can strain the material and see uh, other symmetries being broken, and they see a response to magnetosphere. Any additional questions? I think one, then two. So yeah, so if you go below the superconducting transition temperature, then um, the same loop currents, at least in th this is theory, the same loop currents that were there above, the, above TC would now, in theory, turn into super pair currents below TC. Because now you have super pairs. So they would turn into super pairs currents and that would give you vortices and, and anti-vortices. Sorry, say that again. Um, it allows you to, um, it's a new phase that's not been seen before. So it's a different kind of super. Yeah. No, no, that's a really good question. I have a slide that I, I, I can show you later as well. We've gone down to basically two pulses. And as long, we have a fluence. So there's a certain fluence that we need. So if, as long as we're above that fluence, even as little as two pulses can, can make this transition. It, it, so metastable, you, you know, in the time that we've measured this, it doesn't actually change. A day? Yes. So. Yeah. Um, now you're asking me a technical question, and I, I don't know. I will have to get back to you. I'll have to ask my postdoc and get back to you. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. No, there is no reason. I mean, it's just, it's just, it was just, we have the ability to tune the wavelength, but uh, our lenses inside are set up for some range of wavelengths. We can go from visible to sort of, I, I, I some, uh, you know, I guess we can go in terms of energies, we can go from EV to hundreds of MEV, so we have that range, but we can't go to much lower energies than that. Codons are very low energy, so anything that's above 100 MEV is, is the same as far as the phonons are concerned. So we just pick this energy for convenience. Could you ask that again? No, we never, we never, we never did. 
The, the reason is uh, the effect is uh, so repeatable and reproducible. And we have so many sort of control parameters like the direction, the, ma the fluence, the, um, and this doesn't happen with circularly polarized light. Uh, so we never bothered to change the wavelength. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm just, I would just guess there's strong electron phonon coupling in this system, but beyond that, no. I mean, there, clearly there's strong, it's got a charge density wave, clearly there's strong electron. It's true, and so I don't exactly know why. Um, I mean, one thing about this system that's different from other materials, not all, but it does have these Van, Van Hoek singularity, singularities close to the Fermi energy. Uh, the correlation effects are supposed to be important. I don't know how all that plays into. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open question. Great. Further questions for our speaker? If not, let's thank Professor Madhavan again for a wonderful talk.